This past Friday evening, a special event took place at MIT, an honorary concert for Noam Chomsky, with music by composer Edward Manukian and commentary from Chomsky's friends and colleagues. Our man Chuck Yu, co-producer of the program Green in the Margin, on Wednesdays here at WMBR at 4 till 5.30 p.m., Chuck was there. All right, I was there too. But Chuck made a nice report out of it. And we're going to hear that right now as we fade out the Liberation Music Orchestra with Charlie yeah, Hayden. And that's not what we mean to be listening to either. And here's Chuck's report on the Chomsky tribute concert on what's left. On Friday, January 22nd, 2010, at Kresge Auditorium at MIT, there was a concert honoring MIT Professor Emeritus Noam Chomsky. The event was a tribute to Professor Chomsky, both in words and music. The music performed was composed by Armenian-American composer Edward Newton. This concert was part of the Musical Tribute to Science series, sponsored by the MIT Graduate Student Council. Two of its members, Yoda Pada, a graduate student in the Materials Science and Engineering, and Zanziel Brooks, graduate student in Civil and Environmental Engineering, were the co-MCs for this live event. Here, they introduce and tell us about the program. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We'd like to welcome you to a very special event. Musical Tribute to Scientists is the name of the project created by Edward Manukian, which honors some of the world's greatest minds with musical dedications, as well as works that shed new light on their contributions to science and world of reason. Noam Chomsky is widely considered to be the world's leading intellectual, having enriched our civilization with a great number of books and essays which discuss scientific, political, and philosophical matters with great insight and vigorous research. Professor Chomsky is also often referred to as the father of modern linguistics due to his seminal theory of generative grammar, which has transformed the study of linguistics and has had significant implications on other fields, such as psychology and philosophy. Our opening speaker, Professor David Pesetsky, has been Professor Chomsky's colleague for over 20 years, and he has also conducted important research on the relationship between science and music. He will now say a few words about Professor Chomsky. So I, I first discovered Noam Chomsky through his first published book, Syntactic Structures, which came out in 1957, was assigned to me in college. And with it, I discovered uh, the revolution in linguistics and cognitive science that it launched. So I came to graduate school here at MIT in 1977, stayed here through 82, um, and then after some years teaching at, um, in Amherst and elsewhere, I came back as a faculty member in 1988. So Noam has been my teacher, my dissertation advisor, my colleague, inspiration, a source of ideas, a critic relentlessly of some of them, creator of the field to which my colleagues and I and my own students uh, have been devoting our professional lives. To begin with, he identified language as a defining property of our species, of the human species. That is, that it's the most notable mental capacity that distinguishes us, well, from other primates, those who are most similar to us, and, and from all other creatures as well. He also called attention to the universality of language in the species. That is, every society has a language associated with it, and every normally developing child raised in any environment where he or she can interact with other people will naturally and spontaneously acquire the language of that environment. So, you know, maybe you needed to hear me say this, or, or maybe you didn't, but uh, I've always found these ideas so basic and so obvious once you hear them and put them together, that you wonder why they weren't developed centuries earlier, uh, or why they're just not what everybody on the street knows. Uh, but that, that, of course, is exactly what so often makes revolutionary ideas so revolutionary. That is, it's so often the most obvious facts and the most obvious implications of these facts that are the hardest to see. But no one saw them. Uh, at the same time, you can't just assume that because ideas are compelling and make sense of reality in a general way, that they're therefore true. Right? You want to actually learn how the building blocks and the rules taken together make sense of you know, what makes Chinese Chinese and English English and Eastern Armenian Eastern Armenian. So the question 
that we want to ask next is can we actually explain how these languages work, how they're acquired by babies and used by all of us, uh, what's the, what really is the same and different about speakers of the world's languages. And here we come to a second but very practical but I think equally important achievement of Noam Chomsky's, perhaps as important and revolutionary in its own way as the grand ideas that he more publicly offered to the world, which is our own linguistics program, our department here at MIT. So unique in the world at the time, uh, Noam, along with his collaborator and friend, Morris Halley, and other colleagues who came along as the years went by, created an, a research environment that was as revolutionary in linguistics as the ideas themselves were. Uh, there was nothing like it before, and it set its stamp forever on our field. Well, studying with Noam and studying at MIT with Noam and his colleagues who shared his ideas and vision was the ultimate transformative experience because it not only gave us things to work on and tools for understanding problems, but also a way of interacting with people that was part of the equation and an approach that taught universal respect for seriousness, respect for the content of what people are saying, uh, no respect whatsoever for authority, uh, but lots of respect for our own and other people's best guesses at the truth and an insistence that we stick with what we think must be true even in the face of problems and apparent counter evidence. Uh, the point being that problems for proposals are there to be overcome and solved, not cried over in, you know, in desperation. So why honor Noam Chomsky with a concert? So music like language is a defining property of our species. That is, it's another capacity, mental capacity, that distinguishes us, as far as we know, from all other animals. It's also universal. Every society has music, just like it has language, and every normally developing child raised in an environment where there's music around will acquire, in the sense of being able to understand, the musical system of that environment. So I think music presents us with a very important and sort of deeply Chomskyan set of unsolved questions closely tied in spirit, in fact, closely tied in letter, if, if my work with, with Jonah Katz is correct, to the problems posed by language that have occupied Noam Chomsky and the rest of us for so many years. The thing is, when it comes to the problems I've been describing in the area of music, Noam has never worked on them. And, and frankly, I, I, I can't think of a better way to honor Noam Chomsky today than by giving him some new problems to work on. So we're here not only to honor Noam, but to listen to some fantastic music. But as you do, maybe you can encourage him to think about the following question. Why are we as a species creatures who like to do such a strange thing as sit here while a bunch of people play pitches on various tuned instruments? So Noam, I, I look forward to some ideas and some answers from you. Thank you very much. MIT linguistics professor David Pazeski speaking at the tribute concert for Noam Chomsky at Kiske Auditorium, MIT, Friday evening, January 22nd. And so, Professor Chomsky receives another dedication, this time a song based on words by Bertrand Russell. The words were taken from the last paragraphs of Russell's autobiography, and they have a special significance for Professor Chomsky, who displaced the first quote on the wall of his MIT office. Three Passions is the title of the song, and it will be performed by Lindy Williams, who is one of the organizers of the Musical Tribute Project, and she has traveled from Texas to be a part of this program. Miss Williams will be accompanied by Hisako Hiratsuka on piano. The quote referred to is, Three passions, simple but overwhelmingly strong, have governed my life. The longing for love, the search for knowledge, and unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind.
every piece was a direct dedication to Noam Chomsky. The piece Double Helix for violin and clarinet honors James D. Watson, co-discoverer of DNA structure known as Double Helix. This is a musical interpretation of that structure and is performed by Sarita Yernovsky on violin and Molly Walker on clarinet. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll conclude with a song based on words by Noam Chomsky. They are essentially three quotes taken from some of Chomsky's speeches and writings. Tonight you will hear an adaptation of some of its parts for voice and piano. Lindy Williams and Hisako Hiratsuka. This concert was produced by the MIT Graduate Student Council. Special thanks to composer Edwin Manunkin, the musicians Sarita Yunovaski, Molly Walker, Hisato Hiratsuka, and Lindy Williams. Also, Kevin McComb of MIT's Graduate Student Council and MC's Yoda Pata and Zanziel Brooks. And finally, we would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Noam Chomsky, who we are so happy to see among uh, the audience tonight. <laughs> Noam Chomsky was in the audience. His office manager, Bev Stoller, was willing to give her thoughts on the evening. Well, one thing that really struck me, there was a lot of very serious stuff there. A lot of the pieces were very serious, but there was also joy and, and playfulness. And that describes Noam. I mean, really, a lot of people, everyone knows that he's very serious, but a lot of people don't see his joy. So I was, I was happy to see that. Well, you see that. You've worked with him for decades, and yeah. you see him on, on a oh. daily basis. So how do you feel about this, uh, the inspiration of this concert and the outpouring of affection for him? 
Oh, it's very touching. Very touching. I mean, I really love the playfulness of it. You know, that's him. That's Gnome. That's the other side of Gnome. Yeah, I'm very touched that they did this. I love the Bertrand Russell quote I've been looking at for 15 years, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't read it. So I'm glad that they chose that and a world without war. There's either a world without war or no world at all. Perfect. I have bo- all of those things hanging all over the office. So. so did the composer come to your office and spend some time there and notice? I don't know if he's been there prior to today. So uh, he said he's been corresponding with Noam for about two years. So I think this was the first time I've met him. But how did he know about the Bertrand Russell quote? I think everyone does. I don't know how, honestly. Maybe it's been written in some books, but uh, it, you know, it's been there forever. This is our second poster. The first one disintegrated in the move. So we've had the same poster. has been up for probably 25 years, I'd say. Yeah. Bev Stoll, who's part of Noam Chomsky's support staff at MIT. For WMBR and Open Media Boston, I am Chuck Rosina, along with Linda Pinko at Chris Auditorium at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology.